Okay. I'll get this out of the way. Now then, <clears throat> what I want to talk about is just the fundamentals of turning. Vince Lombardi once said that the team that blocks best and tackles best will win the football game. Okay? That's probably just as true today as it was back in his day. So no matter what you go into in life, whether it's movie making, wood turning, building cabinets, doctoring, whatever it is, fundamentals is what we all have to fall back on. The first part about turning a wood turning on a lathe is it's supposed to be fun. Right? If it's not if we're not having fun, we get new members in this club and they go to a couple open shops and they're not having fun and they're getting frustrated with what they're doing, what's going to happen? They ain't going to be around very long, are they? So, one of the first fundamental things that you have to do have to have to do wood turning is what? A wood lathe. We just happen to have a fine example of one right here. Alan Lacer, the skew guy, he opens one of his videos up with a skew, and he's got this treadle lathe, like an old treadle sewing machine, and he's pumping away on that thing, and he's cutting this piece of wood down and making this spindle. And he talks about all the different kind of lathes there are, and he says that of all the things that you do in wood turning, the wood lathe is probably the least most important thing that you have. We worry about whether the centers line up perfectly and all this stuff. And, well, this, this thing doesn't eject. And it just, you know, all this stuff that we worry about, whether it's got variable speed and all like that, and all that stuff is just, it's fine. You, those of you that have seen my lathe, I've got all the whistles and bells. You know, there's people in here who got better lathes than I got. You know, my goal in life is that when I die, I want to have more toys than George Freeman. <laughs> and I am way behind in that category as we stand. <laughs> okay. When we're talking about wood turning, or when we go to SWAT, and I highly recommend that if you haven't been to SWAT, that you sign up and go this year. There's so much there to see. It is a wonderful experience. I've been, every time they've had it in Waco, except one year I have been to SWAT. And every year that I go, I learn something. Sometimes it's just pick up one little tip here or there from one, one of the professional turners. And you might not even expect to pick up what you pick up. But the better the turner that you become, the more the little bitty details and getting back to the fundamentals helps you be a better turner. I've heard a lot of people stand right up here where I'm standing, and they go over and look at all that marvelous stuff that's over there on the show and tell booth. And they will make this statement. Y'all got a bunch of really good turners in this club. And that is a true statement. But I've got one for you. You can't tell how good a turner somebody is by looking at the finished product. They may have made that bowl nice and pretty and round by using 36 grit sandpaper <laughs> to start with, or as we call a 36 grit bowl gouge. Or they may have made this nice little spindle, a pin or whatever, and they started out by going over to the bandsaw and building them some kind of a jig and saw the corners off of it so they make it eight-sided so it's a little closer to round. Right? Well, the reason the lathe was invented was to make square things round. Now, we ain't talking about bowls here where we got a piece of George wood that's this big square, and it won't even go on here and turn, so we put it on the bandsaw and make it a little closer to round. But finishing that off is what these things were made for. And the reason people get so frustrated in wood turning is because the most important thing that you've got when you're wood turning is your grinder, your sharpening. It's more important than the quality of the tools that you have. Back in the day when they didn't have high-speed steel and 
powdered metal technology and cryogenic treated tools and all this stuff, those tools that they used had to be sharp. You had to sharpen them more often. And the tools that they used to sharpen those with, you could sharpen those tools with a file. Some of the high carbon steel tools, you can actually cut some of that with a file. You can actually sharpen the tools with a file. So the febrile, the rocks that we've always used, work just fine on those tools. Well, over the, it wasn't too long until they got to high-speed steel tools. And the high-speed steel tools don't react very good with the febrile rock. Y'all know what I'm talking about, febrile? They take the particles, the grinding particles, the powder, the dust, or whatever it is, and they glue all these together and form a wheel. And as you sharpen, it breaks the wheel down so that new particles are exposed to cut the steel to make it sharp. A Doug Thompson A11 tool steel tool will ruin a rock. All it does is just create heat and it'll cut the rock all up and it'll mess the tool up and no matter how good that steel is, I'll pass one around here for you to see. No matter how much you spend on it, and you don't get much more expensive than a Doug Thompson tool. This one right here is a half inch bowl gouge. And it's got a, a weird shape on the sharpening end. We'll talk about it a little bit later. But that piece of steel right there is the best steel that money can buy. But 73% of that tool that you're holding right there is nothing but FE. Anybody know what that is? That's right. It's just iron. When you use a rock, a grinding rock, on that kind of a tool right there, all you do is tear the carbides and stuff out that cost so much money to put in that thing and to change it. And to make that steel where it will hold an edge and cut. Now when we do that, all we're doing is we're, all of our sharpness is down on the ground right there. There was an article that I read on the internet about five years ago, five or six years ago, and I haven't been able to find it again. And this guy was a, a scientist and all this, and he went to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt with this experiment and his control groups and all this stuff that that Doug Thompson steel right there will not hold an edge any better than a piece of old high carbon steel that we used to use. Basically, he's saying that anybody that buys one of those things is an idiot. And so I qualified on that count, so I went out and bought me some Doug Thompson steel. I also heard a wise tale that says that you cannot get carbide as sharp as you can get high-speed steel. This comes from the router industry where people make router bits and they make them out of high-speed steel because they're easier to sharpen. They say the carbide doesn't, you can't get it as sharp. That's not true. How many of you use carbide turning tools? I bet you that there's not a person in this room, including myself, that has anything in their shop that can sharpen one of those little carbide cutters as sharp as they are when they come new in the little package or on your tool. And they will dull fairly quickly, and you just turn it a little bit. Got your new edge, you turn it a little bit, and when it's all dull, you get you another one and put on there. But that tool is sharper than probably just about anything that we use in turning, especially us older people that grew up in the day when you used an 80-grit rock, used 36 or 50-grit to shape with, and used 80-grit to sharpen with. I guarantee you, that those carbide tools are sharpened finer than 80 grit. I also heard that if you sharpen a turning tool too sharp, it'll just get dull quicker. You heard that? Okay, so what grit do you sharpen to? 
June issue last year of Woodturner's Magazine had a wonderful article on sharpening and on high-speed steel and particle metal tools. Right now, there's two different uh, companies that I know of. There's probably more that make part of particle metal tools for the Woodturner, and that's Jerry Glazier and Doug Thompson. And they use basically use A11, which is a designated part of steel. What they do is they take all the steel, the iron, and all the little additives and stuff, and they put it, and they melt it, all get it all molten together and all mixed up in there, and then they blow it through a high-pressure nozzle. And it breaks all this down into little bitty fine particles. And this powder, or these particles, are forged back together under the right heat, the right temperature, the right pressure, and all that to make that tool that's going around. And what that does is it makes all the carbides that are formed from the alloys, it makes them very, very small so that they're distributed well through the entire piece of steel so that when you sharpen it, you have an edge of a whole bunch of these little bitty carbides. If you use a grinding rock, an 80 grit or 60 grit or whatever, all it does is tear all those little carbides out and leaves you with nothing but FE, iron. So the man that wrote the article about the Doug Thompson steel not holding an edge any longer than high carbon steel was probably correct in the way that he sharpened his steel. So all of us that have, been, I qualify, I'm talking about myself here, I'm not talking about any of you. Sharpening that Doug Thompson steel on a 80 grit rock, all my good stuff is on the floor and I'm turning with iron. <laughs> Go get the lawn blade off my lawn bore. <laughs> you know, sharpen it up a little bit. It'll cut just as well as that. That's the things that it sneaks up on us as woodturners. Technology is usually out here, and the top technology is not affordable for the average person. The uh, CBN wheels, the carbon boron wheels that I have on this grinder right here, were probably invented in the late 40s. And they used them to sharpen all the tools and tool steel that was used to build all the airplanes and tanks and everything in World War II and all that. The technology for doing that was so expensive that only the manufacturers and stuff could afford it. Well, I come along and we don't have this technology. I start buying grinders and all the stuff that I need to sharpen my Doug Thompson steel, and we don't have this technology out for the, us. And then I can show up SWAT one year, and they've got this stuff. So what we do as wood turners and as just human beings is, okay, let's see, oh, we used an 80 grit, and this cuts a little better, so maybe we can go up to about 120 grit, because we, we don't want this too sharp, you know, because if we get it too sharp, the edge is going to wear out too quick, <laughs> you know. So that's what I did. I bought me a grinder, and I bought an 80 grit wheel, and I bought a 120 wheel, and it worked real good. And I thought I was on to something. Man, I was happy. And then this article in June came out, and this guy suggested that this Doug Thompson steel and the regular high-speed steel, the, the M2 and the M42 steels that we buy, work best and cut better if they're sharpened to 600 grit. <laughs> so I got to go dig in my wallet and get me a 600 grit wheel. <laughs> How many of you have tried the 600 grit wheel? Is there a big difference, Sharon? It's, but just turning, it's, it's night and day difference. It, it's like putting a carbide bit on your spindle roughing gouge. 120 was a light year ahead of what we used before. Even Alan Lacer, the skew guy, he sharpened his 
his SKUs, and then he took a credit card home that was 600 grit and came back and honed those to 600 grit. So, anyway, now then, enough about that. We'll do a little sharpening a little bit later on. That's not what I'm here for. Anybody know what this is called right here? Tail sock. What's inside of this? Morris taper. Number one, number two, or number three? Yep, that's a number two. This and inside of this headstock here are both number twos. Some of the metal lathes have a bigger Morris taper in here so that you can run shafts and stuff through the middle of it to work on long rods and stuff. This is pretty much all we need. Some of the little bitty pin lathes and stuff that you'll see out there will have a number one Morris taper, which is real small. And it works okay, but it's harder to get tools and stuff for. So this is a tail stock. This would be the head stock. What do we call this thing? Goes through the middle here and turns. And spins. Yeah, spindle. Well, that was good, Johnny. <laughs> Caught right on. Okay, there's some threads on this. Right now, in the United States, there's three major sizes of these threads. Does anybody know what they are? W one inch. Yep. And 33 millimeter, the metric thread. It's just slightly bigger than a one inch eight. Okay, now what do we mean when we say one inch eight? We mean that it's one inch in diameter, and there's eight threads per inch. The chuck that you put on this lathe, this is a one and a quarter by eight, I believe. Is that correct? Okay, so this is one and a quarter inches diameter, and there's eight threads per inch. The chuck or the adapter that goes in your chuck has to be compatible to this. <clears throat> there are still some old lathes out there and some from, from other places that'll have a one inch 12 or something like that. A one inch eight chuck won't go on a one inch 12 thread. So when you buy an old lathe from somebody, make sure you know what the thread is. Now there's every kind of thread adapter in the world for those, so don't be scared of them, just know what you're getting into. Okay. On this end over here, we have what we call a hand wheel. So you can turn it to help put the chuck on and whatever thing. This one has a variable speed drive. Do we have to have variable speed drive to turn? It sure is handy, though, isn't it? <laughs> it is a spoiler. Yes, it is. What? Yeah. The Jet used to build, and they weren't the only one, built a lathe that had a Reeves drive in it. It had a couple of pulleys that you could force the belt down into one, make it smaller, and roll down on top of the other one. Those things were a pretty good unit, and you could tune those and make them work, but the problem with them was, was just what the man back there said. You couldn't get it to turn slow enough to turn a big out around blank, or one that had the weight distributed wrong on it. And sometimes we turn things out around on purpose. You want to make something three-sided, like Cindy Drozda does, then you're going to be turning it with it flopping around. You have to turn that a lot slower. You're not going to turn that up to, who's the turner that says life begins at 3,000 RPM? <laughs> you're going to be chasing your lathe around the shop. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Variable speed technology is a wonderful thing. But we don't have to have it to turn with. I know some, I knew one guy that had an old reeve sleeve lathe that shook and vibrated and everything else, and he turned out some of the most beautiful work you've ever seen in your life. What I'm trying to say here is the best steel money can buy, the best lathe money can buy, is not going to make you a wood turner. It can make it easier, but without the basic fundamentals of wood turning, it's not going to help. What can we screw on here? Yeah. 
And there's not just, there's three-jawed chucks, there's four-jawed chucks, there are collet chucks. There's all kind of things you can get for what you want to do. There are, who is that Frenchman, Escalon, or makes the chucks that you can make crooked stuff? Vic Mark and the guy out in Arizona that's got the big display, he's got a chuck that you can put on this thing. It's not cheap but it will turn an oval platter. So just about anything you can imagine you can get for your lathe and make things happen. And a lot of times all it requires is just a little research, getting into it and seeing what's going on. That's why I like to go to SWAT and places like that to see it. Now before I go any further, I don't represent anybody. I'm not getting paid by Doug Thompson or anybody else for what I'm saying. And you certainly have the right to disagree with me. And I certainly don't know everything there is to know about any of this stuff. You know, and I wasn't born 21. I don't know everything. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if we're going to turn a piece of wood in this, ch in this lathe, what is the easiest type of turning to learn spindle turning okay now spindle turning and bowl turning are two different animals this is a spindle roughing gouge it would work on the outside of a bowl but it's not recommended on the inside of a bowl no way why It's got edges here, sharp pointed edges that if you get inside that bowl and you hang one of them, something's coming apart. Either the tool's going to come out of your hand or the bowl's going to go that way. Right? Uh, there's been lots of stuff written about spindle roughing gouges and most of it's true, but we talked about technology. Here is one of the older style, and this is a piece of flat metal. The tang on this thing is flat, and it is heated, and it is curved up like this, and the tang is cut down and everything, and it's sharpened, and it's put in a handle. You get a good enough catch on this one, it will bend this tang, and it can actually break that tang and send this thing flying. Okay, That's why we don't ever turn a bow with one of these. Well... Doug Thompson comes along, and this thing has got a three-quarter inch round shank about that long on it. So that solves this problem, doesn't it? It doesn't make this tool one bit safer to use than this one. This tool can be bent doing spindle work if you get it too far out over the tool rest. You take a square piece of wood put in here, and you start spinning it, and you start cutting it down, this thing keeps further and further from the tool rest, and you've got to, right? You got to move it closer, and keep your fulcrum right here. You won't have any problems with it. You ever worked too far out over the tool rest one of these and got a little? I have, because I know better. See, I can do that. I'm Tim White. I can do that. <laughs> I can use a table saw too. <laughs> Okay? Hey, I did something stupid. I'll admit it. I'm not afraid to admit it. There's not a person in this audience that is not capable of doing something stupid. <laughs> okay. So, the first thing we got to do to use a spindle roughing gouge is we got to make sure it's sharp. Right? Right? This one is sharp, but I'm going to pull my grinder out and talk about it in just a few minutes. And I'm not going to teach you how to sharpen it. Yes, Johnny. I'm going to. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. My, my show, my time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. What I have here 
is, I don't know where we can get where we can see this. I'll put it right over there in the middle. I've got a plug in right here behind this little TV. Uh, this is one of the, my favorite tools right here because it teaches you so many things about wood turning. Okay. Don't you just love to watch the the demonstrator get up here and do all this setup stuff that, that should have been done but couldn't have been done and all this stuff and turn his back on the audience and whatever else. This this metal part of this cabinet from here to here was an old bearing resizing machine for automotive bearings back in the 20s or whatever. And it was given to me. It had a big mess up here. got rid of all that. And I purpose, repurposed it into this. Cut This was solid across the front. I cut this out, made the drawers. Locked. I cut this door out. Made the little, little there to store stuff. This was a picture on the internet of an old wood treadle lathe and my daughter took it and put it in the CNC router and made that and then she designed these tools here these gouges and put them in the wood this is some wood I got somewhere it was just a tree and we cut it down it's pecan I believe anyway made the drawers and the slides and put it together made this piece of course this stuff here is one way most of you know that. On this, I have this thing marked for my different size spindle gouges. Whether I put this in, push it up to the mark, and I'll, I can't remember which one's which. I can look at it real quick and tell, though. And it's that one right there. Now... <clears throat> This is not like other fixtures that you have. Every time you sharpen this, you take a little bit of steel off of this, and this thing falls further and further and further down, right? You, can y'all hear that? It'll go away in a minute. <laughs> so, as this goes further and further down, it makes this angle steeper and steeper, right? So, I had not really paid any attention to that till the other day so we won't worry too much about it but all I'm going to do is with this sitting here I'm going to turn this on and I'm just going to turn it like that this is 600 grit rock one pass we'll do it one of the problems you have with this is you need to start on a side and go all the way to the other side and quit if you start in the center you go to the side then you go back side and then back to the center you've got past the center two or three times and you cut more off of it we do this with our bowl gouges a lot of times a bowl gouge will get a flat nose on it and that can give you some problems when you have to try to start a cut on the edge of a bowl or something so we want this to be as square as we can get it all the way around we want the whole thing sharp because this is a skew I'm not going to mention his, his name, but his initials are Fred Grove. And Fred Grove, I've seen him in open shop use these edges like this, roll that thing over and ride that bevel along and make some of the slickest cuts you've ever seen on a spindle. Fred, have you ever seen yourself do that? <laughs> so, <clears throat> watch the old people. I'm, I don't consider myself one of them yet, but, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that wasn't smart. Next time, yell at me before I start turning the thing, okay? <laughs> I knew he was going to do that. Well, why didn't you say something? <laughs>
Okay. That is all the touch-up this needs. Right here. That's it. So, brought this whole way just for that. This has also got stuff in here. Is that going to, yeah, that's going to be in the way of what, seeing what we're doing. When, when uh, I probably don't do it often enough, uh, some of the guys that I've been mentoring, they'll be cutting along there, and you can tell by the, listening to the way the tool's cutting that it ain't sharp, even with 600 grit. And you go, go sharpen the tool, and they'll touch it up, and it makes a whole world of difference. I'll get into that in a minute, Ed. Yes? It's probably, th that's, y'all hear that? If this, if I go, if I got this set up over there and I sharpen my tool and I cut, if this thing stops turning before I resharpen, I waited too much, too long. Okay? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Ross's idea. Just leave the grinder running. Everybody be honest. How many of you hate to sharpen? Put your hands up. Hate to sharpen. <laughs> Fundamentals of wood turning. Sharp tool is more important than the type of tool. Okay? I don't care whose steel it is. If it's dull, it's not any good. Right? Okay. <sighs> Go ahead. Uh-huh. Yep. I'd use the absolute best tool I got. If you're... That tops of steel is really good stuff, and it, it doesn't dull any faster on bark and stuff like that than it does anything else. And all you got to do is take it over to your 600 grit wheel, touch it, and go right back to work, and it'll make your life a whole lot easier. That's my opinion. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> Miss Sharon, I'm going to pick on you because you always sit down front like a good student that you are. What is that? Yeah, somebody said safety drive. I like to say it's a smart drive because it tells you a lots of things about about what kind of work that you're doing. And anybody that can see this, I bought this one from Alan Lacer. Uh, one Way makes one of these now that's got a spring-loaded point in it that's really, really nice. So, goes in the Morris taper. If... My tool is not sharp. I'm going to have all kinds of problem turning. When you start getting catches with this, and I don't have any grooves or anything cut up. I'm first starting out, I got me a little center made. This is where the old eyes don't work. All right, we get that in there. That's pretty good. All right, now then, when I turn this on, I can still turn this by hand, right? But that should be tight enough for us to round this off. Rest a little bit below center. All right. Uh, can everybody see? There we go. 
What am I doing? What would you say? I'm rubbing the bevel. (laughs) The first time I heard that term, the first thing that came to my mind was, why would anybody want to do that? (laughs) All right? So, rubbing the bevel as it applies to wood turning is right here. This thing is not centered. I can turn this lathe on. That's fast enough. We don't have to go 90 miles an hour. But I can drop this handle down, and I can rub that bevel and not cut. Notice where I put my hand. If I want to cut, all I have to do is raise the handle of this tool. See it cut? That's rubbing the bevel. Now, I've got that safety drive in there with nothing else, and I'm not getting a cut. I'm not getting a catch. If I want to get a catch, it's real easy to do. Just drive it straight in. You can get all the catches you want with this thing. It doesn't matter. If your tool is dull, it will not do this. Quarter of a turn. All right. I don't know why people play around with this stuff. I'm rubbing the bevel on that too. Put the bevel on the wood, raise the handle till I get the cut I want, and just move it. I don't have to use my fingers to guide this thing. That bevel will guide it. That is a decent cut for a roughing gouge. This is pine. Anybody want to come up and look at it? Now then, here I was sitting here all smug with the world and thought I know just about everything there is to know about us roughing, making a blank round. Another one of our members admitted to me over at his shop the other day that in blanks and pepper mill blanks and everything like that, he would take them over to his bandsaw and use his jig, and he would cut these corners off before he put them in the lathe. Because turning these things around, too much chipping in, just too much problem. Did I have any problem getting that around? I'm not going to mention his name either, but his initials is Rod Brumlow. Gary Sanders did his demonstration Back in November. It was the last one of the year. Is that right? And Gary Sanders demonstrated how to make a Christmas ornament. And he took a basic bowl gouge. And he, in just a few seconds, probably quicker than I just did it with with the tool that's designed to do it, he made that spindle go from square to round. So I'm going to ask him to come up and demonstrate that technique for us. Because he did it so fast, I didn't get to see him. I'm even going to chuck the piece of wood up for him. That's how nice a guy I am. What? (laughs) All right. Tell us what you're going to do. supposed to be nice to me. Um, anyway, <laughs> when, you know, we he got talking about having more toys when you die. When I first started turning, it was the complete opposite. It was who can turn the most different kinds of ways with the fewest amount of tools. And that's why when I learned how to turn, or, or taught myself how to turn, most of the turners that I was associating with were professional turners 
and they used nothing but a spindle gouge for 90% of their turning. It didn't matter if it was spindle, bowl, whatever. And so the, the, the main thing as far as roughing with a bowl gouge, if you take this, if I can get this out of here, and you look at it, and you turn this tool slightly, you can see you've got this big surface area, and then you've got the, the edge right here. So you've got to have a little bit of an angle in it as you're going. The advantage to a bowl gouge is that you can go easily both directions. Or roughing gouge, I mean. So you can go a little bit quicker than I can by using the roughing gouge. The advantage to this is that by turning it slightly, I'm now at this angle, so for me to be able to go back and forth, well, the two rests is fine. I just keep getting tangled up in this cord. But if I'm at this angle to come back, now I've got to come at this angle. So all my cuts are going to be in one direction, just because otherwise I've got to do this to come back. So I'm going to rough it out like so. And then the advantage to this tool over the bowl gouge is that I've got all this edge that I can do whatever I want to do to it. So if I want to go from a square to a round, or if I want to do some really fine shear cuts, I don't have to change tools. Yes. Yes, sometimes. Sometimes. But you can see, because of this sharp edge pointed in that direction, it would be, I would almost have to use a skew to get a better cut on that square edge right there than this tool. This is a V, I use Vs. Yes. So, it, it's not that big of a deal to me. I use these because I get them, basically. They're, these are one ways, they are powdered. Um, the older style, the round bottom, I've used, I've still got some, and it's just, Go with it. I don't, I don't care which one is which. I can use either one of them. Are you signed up for the mentoring program? I thought I was. What? I thought I was. You nobody, thought I was? Okay. nobody ever calls me, so. Okay. Well, there's going to be a change in because I'm supposed to be coordinating that, and I will be calling you. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've changed my phone number. Hey. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you Gary. You bet. can train somebody. I put it on right this time. How about that? You can hear me again, huh? Sucks for you. <laughs> All right. This cut that he just made going from square to round has a name. Does anybody know what it's called? Pummel cut. You see it on newel posts, sometimes on stair balusters where they go from square to round. And I'm going to take this off. There's other techniques to use to cut this in, in the way he did, but there's, I'm going to take this off and just, in those few seconds, I want you to look at the quality of that cut that he put right on that pummel. Remember this out on the end, he was just demonstrating that. So, now then, while these are going around, this is the one I did with the roughing gouge, and this is the one he did. And the pummel cut, cut right there is the only part that counts on quality of cut, okay? Now then. just about through with this thing. I've got this block of wood here. It is a cube. How many sides does it have? Six. Very good. So, do these look familiar to anybody? Have we seen these recently in the club? Was it Timmons that came to the demo on this? 
All right, I had to mark this. This is the end grain right here, on this side and on this side, and the rest of these four pieces are side grain. Okay, so I promised I'd get to this, and I'm here now, Johnny. Spindle turning is when the side grain is facing you. It runs parallel to the bed of the lathe, to the ways of the lathe. Okay, spindle turning, we use certain techniques. We use, I can put this big block up here and I can take this spindle roof and gouge and I can make it round. And I'm doing good. If we take this same block of wood and we turn it like this to where that the side grain is now running perpendicular to the bed, this is bowl turning. I don't care what you're making. You've got it in spindle turning mode and you're making a vase that's this long. That's still spindle turning. Hollowing is a whole other creature. We, we're not going there tonight. So this is spindle turning. And we want to cut in the direction of the grain, right? So if we turn it to where that our side grain is like this, we're going to cut like this, correct? going to come from here and come around this direction we're cutting because this is now the end of our pencil and we're sharpening it this direction did I say anything that's wrong there okay this has got the self eject and that's right here You're supposed to get a great big sledgehammer and really hit that hard, aren't you? When you get yeah. bigger the hammer, the better. Okay. So now then, I have a device on my live center at home that I can chuck this up. So you're going to have to play like I've got my live center in there, okay? So if I take this and I stick this corner right there. <sighs> Is it going to make it? Probably not. And I stick this corner in my live center. And one of those little pin centers, you know, the safety, the what they call it, the mandrel saver pin centers, will work just fine here. And I do that. And I've got a bearing here and everything's spinning. Which direction do I cut? <laughs> 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 so that's what you get into when you come up with hard fast rules you try cutting it this way and if it's chipping out and if try cutting it somewhere another direction but the first thing you do is what sharpen your tool if the cuts not going the way you want it sharpen the tool have you ever heard this or have you ever said these words well, this tool just won't cut as good as that tool. Well, this, 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 this lathe right here just won't do. How many times in your life have you said something like that and it turns about out to be operator error? <laughs> right? A wood turner must be brutally honest with themselves. Rubbing the, rubbing the bevel on a bowl gouge on the outside of the bowl and on the inside of the bowl are two different animals. That's another entire class. You start learning how to rub the bevel with a spindle gouge. Start with spindle turning. Get blanks like the ones I passed around. They're cheap. If you need some, tell me. I'll cut you a bunch of them. George is going to bring some of them to open shop. Get over there and make Big square sticks, little bitty round sticks, and take it down in, in segments. Take it down in increments. If it's two inches in diameter, take it down till it's round and make it the same diameter all the way across. Then take it down another quarter inch all the way across. Try to get your cut right. Try to get everything nice and straight. 
This is not a finger guide. That bevel is what guides you. Rub the bevel, raise the handle. Rub the bevel, raise the handle. My open shop, we're going to have a demonstration on these. If you're coming to open shop and you have a spindle roughing gouge, bring it. I guarantee you, we can use it and we can have fun with it. This is my favorite, too. Sharon's pretty good with one of these. I watched her making some, some deals one day at open shop over at Frank's Road, some what they call fidget sticks. And, you know, it took her probably 30, 45 seconds to get those from squared around. I don't know what she was taking so much time for. <laughs> Are you signed up for mentoring? Okay, all right. But when you see some of us at open shop, new, old, whatever, don't hesitate to come grab one of us by the ear and ask us to show you something. If you have a better way of doing this or teaching this than I do, please come show me. Okay? All right. Yes. Exactly. And if I could have one of those sticks back up here, we'll deal with that right now. That was one of the things I was going to put in here. Okay, I threw it down somewhere. Here it is. Martin, I thank you for bringing that up. That's something that, that I wanted to, to mention anyway. All right, how many different ways have I heard this stated? Uh, kiss the bevel is a new one for me. That's the first time I've heard that, Martin. Appreciate that. What? Float the bevel. That's a Stuart Batty turn, right? Uh, another one of our members whose name I will not mention, but I, her initials are... Donna Frazier. She was at an open shop and she was floating this bevel along and she did not put enough impetus on the direction she's moving the tool to make a solid cut. So she was making a little bitty scallop cuts like this. She was using a bowl gouge. And one of the bowls that she showed, the first one she showed tonight, was one of them that she was working on. <clears throat> that bevel right there. When you raise that handle, that bevel is what is gauging the depth of your cut. The back side of that bevel, right just about a, maybe a sixteenth of an inch of it, is rubbing on that wood. And that sets the depth of cut. To make it cut deeper, you have to raise the handle higher. Okay? If we... If we start rubbing that bevel here, and I push down on it, can you see that mark it's putting there? That's burnishing the wood. If I raise it till it makes a cut, now I have to move it along to get it to cut. If I just do that and then quit, then I just scallop it all the way down. So, I am floating or whatever. The bevel, the wood coming through this cutting edge is pushing that bevel down against the wood and that is all the impetus it needs. It's feeding itself. It cannot cut any deeper if I don't raise the handle anymore. So that's where the bevel is rubbing along there. Okay? And this, this gouge has been used and it's not as sharp as that other one because I didn't sharpen it first. But it still cuts pretty good. The different positions that you can have this bevel in are, we've heard rubbing, of course. We've heard kissing the bevel, gliding the bevel, floating the bevel is another one of Stuart's terms, right? 
you can also have catching the bevel. <laughs> okay? That's when you get a catch. It's when you lose that bevel. That's going to guarantee you a catch. I'm taking this tool and I'm sticking it straight in. It's going to catch. If I start it and then come down to the rub, it's the same drive that was spinning a while ago and now it's cutting just fine, isn't it? Right? When we get the bowl turning, raising the bevel means something different. It means moving the handle in the direction of the groove. What do you call this thing? What? The flute. Moving it, thank you, moving it in the direction of the flute. If I'm on the inside of a bowl like this to raise the bevel, I've got to move the handle toward the flute. That's going to make it dig in there more. Then I can bring it around and make my cut, and the bevel will always be in contact. The inside of a bowl is a totally different animal turning than the outside or spindle. And that's something that we try to tend to lump and everything. First thing you need to know, learn, and this took me years to learn this, is how to feel that bevel. Once you get the feel of that bevel rubbing, am I lying? If once you get the feel of that thing rubbing, then you no longer have to watch your tool to see what it's doing. You can start watching the profile out here because you know what your tool is doing because you can feel it. I do most of my turning with my hand back here. But the only time you'll see me go to the rest is when I have to make a starting cut. And that is another fundamental or a skill. I'll give you a quick one on it. It's kind of like what Gary did a while ago. How many of you like to turn natural edge bowls? So you got this piece of timber that you have mothered and cared for and all this stuff, and you got this beautiful bark on it, and it's set on there nice and everything, and now we're going to make this natural edge bowl with this bark on it. And we're trying to make those last cuts, and we're trying to start that gouge on the edge of that bowl, and it skates and runs back on us. And knocks all our bark off. Never happened to me. <laughs> Never happened to you? I was watching Rudy a couple of years ago at squat. It's squat. <laughs> it's SWAT, and he talked about that very thing. I got this little 3 8 bowl gouge here. It's pretty dull, but we're going to cut with it anyway. The secret to making that starting cut right there, no matter whether it's a bowl, or we just want to face the end of this off right here. It's the same. If we want to make that pummel cut, it's exactly the same. When we first start this cut on this bouncy thing here, we have no bevel to guide us, do we? So we've got to get in there a little bit before that little bitty thin bevel right there can start working. We're also cutting a lot of air, aren't we? Number one thing... When you're doing this, is you're set up for this. You have all different positions you have your bowl gouge in. And this is not everything. This is when you're starting your cut with bark, whether it's outside or inside the bowl. You want to set your tool level. Turn the bevel halfway, and you want to set that bevel with it level. The point of your flute needs to be right on center. This is just a little bit low. Okay, that looks pretty good right there. We'll try that. Don't work the first time, we'll do it again. One of our members came over to my shop one day and we spent the whole afternoon doing just this. What? Starting a cut right there on the outside of it. We faced it off round. It doesn't matter whether it's square or round. This technique will work. And the reason I'm showing you on this edge right here that's not straight is because when you're turning a natural edge vessel, you've got a lot of air you've got to turn. Correct? Until you get down far enough inside it where you got a full cut. 
I like my speed to be as much as I can stand here when I'm cutting a lot of air. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the tool wrist and this thumb and this what's left of this finger, and I'm going to start this dead level right on the edge of this. Now, once I've got it in there just a little bit, it begins to hold itself. I can open it up and I can cut right down. And this is grossly out of round. Once I get the bevel, I can open that tool up and it'll really cut. As Stuart tells you, this thing is, this thing will do, bowl gouge will do stuff that no other tool will do. It'll do two operations at the same time. The point is cutting and the wing is peeling. With a skew, you can cut or you can peel, but not both at the same time. I did have something else I wanted to point out. This is another little Stuart Batty. Yes. It's a Hanny Michelson 45, 40 grind. And Stuart Batty's wrong. I can duplicate his grind exactly on that rig right there. I guarantee you. The only difference in the two grinds is that this wing... Did y'all see the one I passed around? Everybody see it? This wing is ground all the way back over here, and it's 40 degrees all the way around. I can have this inside of a bowl cutting right like that and not get a catch. It's nearly, nothing is impossible. I worked with Johnny Hare. <laughs> it's nearly impossible to get a catch inside of a bowl with this grind. Okay, so parting tool. This is another little Stuart Batty thing in his Vimeo videos. We're taught that we're going to peel with that parting tool like this, you know, start it down like that. If you do that, see the splintering I get? Stuart says, now this is pine, it's pretty splintery anyway. Stuart says that you take this and you plunge it straight in. And you don't get nearly as much splintering. If it's on a round piece of wood, it will give you almost none. Straight in. Peel. See the fuzz coming up? Sharpen it to 600 grit also. Okay. The one thing that I have not mentioned in this whole thing is safety. <clears throat> Cowboy wisdom. There's a deal on the internet that you can get on. Talks about a lot of things. People will tell you, well, use common sense and good judgment. Let's talk about common sense. Years ago in the fire department, I was making a PowerPoint. And this was when, when a Pentium 75 was the best computer you could buy. Okay? And I was working on this PowerPoint, and I had these pre-made. I'm, I'm done. This one I'll finish. I had these pre-made slides and everything, and I was making them on the computer. And my oldest son was standing over here. And he was just foaming at the bits. He wanted to get on there and play some game or something like that. So I just told him, I said, it's going to be a while. So I took a break. And when I came back, he was in there on the computer. And I started to gripe at him, but I looked. And he was turning these slides out faster than I could think. And I says, where did you learn how to do that? He said, it's just common sense, Dad. <laughs> okay so what does common sense mean it means sense is common to everybody if you've never been around one of these in your entire life and you've been to a couple of meetings you don't have a lot of common sense about machinery this thing is an inanimate object it can do wonderful work for you or it can hurt you it's just strictly up to you all right 
Good judgment. Cowboy wisdom says, and I'm going to leave everybody with this. It says, <clears throat> good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.